Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to uh, another ZCT. This is just going to be a quick little rapid fire episode where Matt and I kind of address some of the questions and comments that you guys left uh, in the past couple episodes. So let's just get right into it. Um, this is from <clears throat> the episode seven where we talked about kind of a bunch of different stuff like the best generation MR2, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a few questions we got. Um, Don't forget to shout out. Do what? The user as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, okay, so Dylan Sorensen, or is it Sorensen? Sorry if I butchered your name. Would you recommend more new track enthusiasts look into the MRS instead of the Miata, or is the greater love for the Miata justified? So, I've never tracked an MRS, but I have tracked a Miata, and I've driven both cars quite a bit in the canyons in various different forms. Um, so, I, I guess I can say a little bit about that. I think... Okay. If you're just looking for a cheap platform to learn how to drive a car, especially like a uh, a rear wheel drive car that has very natural like front engine rear drive handling dynamics and also has a huge aftermarket for like support and a huge community that actually tracks them. So you can kind of like get real deep in the community, find people who can help you along, you know, your journey with your build and everything um, at Miata's, I mean, obviously the way to go. Right, I mean, Miata's right. always the answer. Like that saying exists for a reason. Right. Um, with the MRS, I do think you're getting probably like you're getting into a little bit more of a advanced kind of driver's car, where like mid-engine rear-wheel drive cars in general, um, it's a little bit harder to drive at the limit. I think because you're dealing with more of that kind of like liftoff oversteer and some of the other things that are. We won't go in too much into that, but like. The other driving dynamics that like make MR a little bit harder than FR, in my opinion. And you're dealing with the fact that there's not quite as big of an aftermarket. So right. your limit, your options for coilovers, for example, is going to be more limited with the MRS. Also, I think um, stock for stock, they're kind of both cars are kind of similar in performance. If you get like a say a 1.8 liter NA Miata or even like an NV Miata versus a stock MRS, they're kind of similar in weight and power and all that. Um, but with Miatas, you have more options if you want to go turbo, if you want to do a motor swap, um, even like people have done LS swaps, not that I recommend that, but, <laughs> um, you have more options. People have tried more things with MRS. Like you can either keep it stock, you can turbo it, or it's either that, or like you do it like a two ZZ swap, which is um, insane, which is yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. Still. So there's pros and cons to both platforms, but I think for a beginner, Miata is the way to go. Yeah, and I think for beginners, like when we go out to the track, it's obvious when what you should choose. You see way more. Of I probably have maybe seen like less than five MRSs in my the time track. that I've tracked for you know four or five years or whatever. Yeah, like compared to the the dozens of yeah. hands, that you don't, I've seen you don't have enough hands to count the number of Miatas at a track day. Right, and I think like the availability is like the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you can find one cheap. Mm -hmm. The aftermarket, you can go hardcore and get really advanced stuff. Yeah. Or you can go, you know, very beginner and still upgrade your car. There's still a lot of options that are very small and not very expensive. But when I'm thinking about MRS upgrades, I don't know what's out there. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, you know, that's why we like to hear from people in the comments, you know, who maybe they do have MRS experience, but like the aftermarket is just going to pale in comparison. Yeah. And, and I'll actually link a card. In, in like at the top of this video for the uh, review I did on uh, 2ZZ swapped MR2 Spider. So that my good friend Oleg, he built that car from basically like a $2,000 beater st bone stock car into a 2ZZ swapped like kind of daily slash track car. So that'll give you guys some probably some insight if you're thinking about doing um, a track build. But like even he like ran into some issues like he had to go with like he, he couldn't find the proper coilovers for it. So he went with just shocks oh, and springs. And you can kind of tell when you drive it, it's kind of soft. Right. But anyways, right. Um, so that's enough on that topic. I think the MRS is way cooler, though. It, it, it kind of is, though. But as a, yeah. honestly, as a driving experience, I prefer a stock. Uh, I prefer FR. a Miata to a stock MRS. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay. So I'll go into this because I got a lot of comments. I think in that... Uh, episode seven, I talked about the fact that I might be selling my S two thousand to get a daily, tra daily drivable track car. Sure. So that is completely out the window. If you guys haven't noticed, <laughs> I think I'm kind of like late to the party on like updating you guys. But 
I mean, judging from my track videos I've been putting out, it's, it's pretty clear that, you know, I'm still keeping the S2000 as a track car. I'm doing upgrades to it and such. Um, <clears throat> so the car I was actually considering very, very um, seriously at the time was a Civic Type R. So I was going to sell the BMW, sell the S2000, pony up another, I don't know, like call 10, it 10 grand 20, or yeah. something, 10, 15 grand and get like a used Civic Type R FK8. And just because, like, when I've driven um, Dave's car, you know, I, I drive, I've driven his car so many times now. Once on the street when it was stock, once at Laguna Seca with just wheels and tires, then again at um, Thunder Hill uh, East okay. with, like, a bunch of mods on it. And it's a really, really capable and fast car for what it is. And given the fact that it's, like, really comfortable as a daily driver, it's got, you know, all the latest technology in it for, for the most part. Um, and it's super practical with a hatch, like... I was sold on it. Right. As a daily perspective, it has everything you need, but then like it has that trackability aspect. It's yeah. kind of like a way better Fiesta ST. Let's just face it. <laughs> and this is like another like side note, but like you were kind of. Yeah, I was, you know, too. toying with the idea as well. But then I was just like, oh, I'll probably save more money. Just, you know, try to just get better at um, the Fiesta ST. And I think maybe I'll just switch to a real wheel drive car in the future. Yeah, so I didn't want to switch fun. over to an expensive front wheel drive track car. But um, so that's kind of my thought behind that. But you should describe, you know, you, you show in your videos what made you change your mind. But describe what it was that made you change your mind. So I was about to go into yeah. that. So the thing, the literally the thing that made me change my mind is, so I drove, you know, I'll probably give a card to the Civic Type R stock versus modified comparison I did at Thunder Hill East. So I drove Jami's stock CTR for one session. And then, so at the, no, the, my first session, I, I drove my S2000 at the time. Sure, okay. And then I drove Jami's stock CTR. And then I drove Dave's modified CTR. And I was like, holy crap, this car is so awesome. And I was already really impressed with the stock CTR. And then I jumped into my friend Jeff's AP1 S2000 with a ton of mods <laughs> on it. JRZ RS Pro, three-way coilovers, Kingpin spherical bushings, like uh, ATS Carbon LSD, like just the perfect setup stripped out track S2000. And when I drove that thing, I was like, forget it, man. I'm not, I can't go front wheel drive. Even though the Civic Type R is like the best handling, most neutral handling front wheel drive car you can probably buy right now. Right. And like you do not really feel the front wheel drive limitations nearly as much as in other cars. The S2000, that S2000 just like it completely changed my perspective. I was like, this feels like a race car. The Civic Type R feels like a fast street car. And so that's I mean, that's just like so basically after that point, I was like, well, I can't afford to make my S2000 like Jeff's. But if I can do like all the same mods, but like at a lower tier of like parts, sure. like parts, I can probably get it to 80 to 90% of how his car feels at like, say ha like half the cost. Right. Right. And you can that, get that iteration and then build it yeah. up and then try to get to that. At least you have something to shoot for now. Exactly. You have, like, something to compare to. And now I'm, so now I'm on that journey of like slowly building up my S2000. Like I went with the big stop tech, big brake kit. Um, I, he has the, um, the AP racing, which is the next tier up. <laughs> right. Uh, I went with the Belate spherical bushings. He has the Kingpin spherical bushings, which is the next tier up. But I'm, my car is slowly getting to that point where, like, it is – it's something I want to keep driving and learning on. Cool. So. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, and then while you're, I guess you're gonna look up the next yeah. question, but you know, as you slowly progress, you know, that car, it, it'd be cool to always, you know, I think you've already commented in some of your videos, like how you felt about some of the upgrades. So I think you know, people are gonna be really interested in your yeah. journey now. I guess it's kind of like a journey now that you're saying that you're going on, and you know, a lot of people are gonna be interested. Yeah, in that. yeah. So I'm gonna yeah. keep that as a track car as long as I keep tracking. I'm gonna keep that thing until I've more or less outgrown it or totaled it or something well, well, <laughs> well, uh, knock on wood. All right, we'll see. yeah um okay so another um question from emmanuel um guerrero future topic is the k series going down as a legendary motor and why so this is probably like outside of your realm because yeah, you're not really your a honda guy so yeah i mean obviously he's talking about the honda k you know 20 k24 series of of engine which really you know came out within the last 20 years, less okay. than 20 years, I think. Um, so I think the answer is yes, if if not already legendary, because up to that point, like you, all your 90s, like VTEC motors, that like in your Integra type bars, um, you know, your Preludes and what have you, they were all the B series. Like you got, had mm. the B16, the B18, 
and they were really good motors they were like <clears throat> pretty revolutionary at the time because you're, you're talking about like a 1.6 or 1.8 liter little naturally aspirated engine dual cam um you know vtec like variable valve timing on the intake and the exhaust cams and you know revving to like nine thousand and like yeah <laughs> making more than 100 horsepower per liter like they were pretty crazy at the time but then when the k20 series hit um i think the first car in the u.s that got it was like the um the rsx type s okay and then like a few other cars got it later um that car changed the game stock for stock uh it already makes more power because it's a bigger engine, like a two liter, um, makes more torque. And the key thing is they're more tunable because with the B series, okay. you're talking about, and this is kind of similar with the F series, like the F20 and the F22C and the S2000 as well. Right. Those earlier 90, those earlier 90s decade Honda motors were pretty much like Honda engineered the crap out of them to be, to perform as well. And that they squeezed every last horsepower out of, the engine that they okay. can get you can throw like even nowadays you take a stock s2000 motor you can throw intake headers exhaust tune all that crap and like you're without touching the internals you're still talking about like maybe you'll gain 10 15 wheel horsepower at most like you're spending like i don't know like five yeah, grand to do that it's like is it even worth it at that point um whereas the k series like honda still left a little bit of breathing room in there i don't know so i'm not an engineer i don't know exactly what they did to make it do that but like they move i know they moved to iv tech which is like intelligent v tech it's like a slightly different system but now you're talking about you can do those bolt-ons in a tune and potentially gain 20 25 30 plus horsepower so now you're talking about a two liter that can make like close to 300 horsepower at and, the crank. and reliably you're saying reliably you can't do that with a two liter s2000 without like really touching the internals interesting okay um so i think it is going to be go down as a legendary motor and like you know the, i've driven a k20a tw uh which is a integra type r uh, jdm engine that got swapped into um this guy dj's uh del sol oh right and while i have to say like that car was a little sketchy to drive because like the steering rack was like out of a crx or something and like <laughs> a lot of torque steering that, that yeah, yeah that chassis is like really old and couldn't really handle the power the engine itself was fantastic mm. like it bl blows the s2000 motor out of the water in terms of just outright power um and torque like the big right, thing you right. get with the k series is torque and if you go to K24, which is like a 2.4 liter, you get even more torque. Got it. Um, so it kind of like almost revolutions and re changes the perception that Honda motors have no torque because now you have the revs, the high RPM power and the torque. So yeah, I so, think it's going to be legendary. Got it. So and then the difference between the F and the K then, what what are the, for the people who are watching that don't so, know? So I mean, that. the F series only came in the S2000. Oh, okay, um, okay. So that's a longitudinally mounted engine. So, and in all the, like the K series are transverse mounted for front wheel drive cars. Got it. Um, and now you have like the K20C series, which is the new turbo motor in the Civic Type R. Right. And like that make, that's a two liter that's pushing out 306 horsepower. Obviously it's turbo, but like you can, you can get close to like 400 from that thing <laughs> with, with all the bolt-ons in a tune. That's crazy. That's so, crazy. Definitely a legendary motor. Cool. And then, uh, yeah, as you queue up the next question, I think it, it's also a testament to Honda, Honda engineering. I think those engines in particular, they like go into other cars. Like, I think there's even options for like the Ariel Atom. Yeah. They, yeah. they use Honda engines. Yeah. And then like the, oh no, never mind. I was going to mention the Lotus, but that's, that's Toyota. That's Toyota. Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the Ariel Atom, uh, one of the generations came with a K series. Yeah. Engine. So perfect Just case like, in point. Yeah. Exactly. So. All right. And I think the last question here, which is kind of a like a full-fledged question is, do you think buying a salvage title car is worth it? For example, a car that is salvaged due to theft or collision that doesn't affect the frame. Is it worth it even though the resale value is considerably lower? And if you get in an accident, insurance won't pay a lot for it either. This is by Josh Kim. Hmm. This was... <sighs> I've thought about this before, but for me, like just the stigma of buying a salvage title car is so unappealing that like for me, I would never consider it unless I was literally just buying a car to be where I know like I'm just going to turn it into like a beater, beater right. track car where I, I expect to get zero return on my investment, like potentially not even be able to sell it. 
Right. I think that's the main thing is because, I mean, we all shopped for cars, right? And whenever you see like this weird, like really cheap example of something that you're looking for, you're like, oh, why is this so cheap? You click on the Craigslist ad, you look, you scroll down, you're like, oh, it's salvage. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I don't oh, want to deal it. with this. <laughs> so like, imagine owning a car like that with the salvage or branded title and trying to sell it. You're going to deal with that scenario that I just talked about. And it's going to be extremely difficult to sell. And the problem is, is that no one really knows how to price these cars that are yeah. branded or salvaged. Right. So your guess is as good you as mine. You don't really are. have a good reference point. It's like, what, what is the salvage XYZ really worth? Right, right. And then no you kind of get into the shady gray area. Like, okay, yeah, this one's branded, but it says it's theft. Yeah, due to theft or like hail damage. Or, hail, yeah, like what is what damage. does that mean? Like, like you gotta like do your homework, go see the car in person, do a full PPI. Like if you want to go the full nine yards, maybe you can make it worth it. Yeah, but, maybe some people and they can chime in in the comments. They found a gem that was a salvage just by theft. Yeah, and the internals and the engine were perfectly perfectly fine, and they were able to make their dreams come true and get a really cheap car. But I feel like more than not. You're going to just get something that is going to be really hard to sell uh, and really hard to uh, get your value of, you know, make it worth it. Yeah. Um, but like you said, Finn, if if you get it and you know you're just going to track it, you're not going to sell it again. You could potentially pick up a car that, um, you know, would be a lot cheaper than if it wasn't a salvage title. Yeah. Like if you're if your intent is just to buy a cheap like I know we just had Terrence on talking about drifting. If you're just trying to beat a buy a beater drift car that which you think there's a 50 50 50 chance you're going to end up just squishing it into a wall not, not a bad a, idea not a bad right? option like, just make sure like the frame is relatively straight i guess and do your homework obviously don't just like buy it sight unseen whereas like a clean title car i mean i would never recommend buying a car sight unseen period but like you can get away with that with a clean, right, so, right. So, a clean title car with a salvage child car it's like i don't unless you're just buying it for like the motor to like swap into something else i just wouldn't yeah and then another thing is like if something's salvaged and you don't know what happened to it there could also be some safety concerns with it too yeah and i think that's why i would stay clear is like you don't like there could be something wrong with it that's under the surface and then you could get into like some kind of serious it's like a accident can of worms you could open up right there. Yeah, yeah so i mean so take that with the grain of salt I think both of us personally, we would not recommend it, but the scenario in which we would is like, if you know, you're going to like go, you know, full track mode and respect or expect no return on investment. Yeah. If you, so. if you can throw that money into the car and be okay with just not getting any a single penny of it back. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. But I don't, I don't treat cars that way. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, All right. All right. I think that's pretty much it. Um, as always, if you have other like you know, full blown topics you want to talk about us to talk about in the future. Um, you know, we'll try to bring on guests that like suit the, you know, the topic at hand or if just like basic questions, like the ones we covered today. Um, we can just, you know, cover this in a, in a future, um, rapid fire episode as always. Thanks for watching and see you guys next time.